This is Live Fire, with the latest news about threats to your liberties and your right to keep and bear arms. Our guests include elected and other public officials, journalists, citizen activists, and others who are fighting for the Bill of Rights, especially the Second Amendment. Live Fire covers a broad range of constitutional issues, particularly the debate over private ownership of firearms. Our host is Larry Pratt, Executive Director of Gun Owners of America. Remember, the issue is not just about gun control. It's about control. Now, here's your host, Larry Pratt. Hello and welcome to this edition of the News Hour. You know, for most of us, the border is a word. Uh, we see it on a map. It doesn't really connote anything in particular other than something artificial. And maybe we've heard of the Border Patrol and uh, we know that they're the ones that keep an eye on everything happening along, especially our southern border. It's a lot bigger a deal if you live on the border. And Aaron Anderson actually lives on the border. If you go south on her property at a certain point, you're going to be in Mexico. Uh, It's that close. And that has some consequences that a lot of us really don't think about but for somebody situated the way Aaron is, well, it's actually a tragedy. And it uh, certainly impelled her to do a number of things, one of which uh, a few years ago was to write a book called The Open Borders Lobby. She doesn't think a whole lot of the wisdom of having an open border. Uh, Aaron, why would people not want to have the security of a sealed border where we can regulate and control who comes in? Um, Good question. My observation was I got um, involved in this issue very up close and personal as a consequence of, of 9-11. I happened to be in the parking lot of the Pentagon on 9-11. Oof. And then uh, then was to find out that the man, the terrorist who puts the plane into the Pentagon, actually comes from an al-Qaeda cell in Tucson, Arizona. And my family home is on the Arizona-Mexican border. And it doesn't take long for someone to connect the dots. And uh, I, like many, I, like many others, after the day after 9/11, we all got reassigned. One of the things, though, I was doing as just Jane citizen, uh, concerned Jane citizen, because I also um, was living in, in, in Northern Virginia at the time. The terrorists of 9/11, seven of them, I think, had uh, the benefit of Virginia driver's licenses. So. I and other citizens like myself went to the Richmond uh, State House to start robbing for more secure Virginia licenses. And I was shocked to find that something I thought would have been a no-brainer, that they would have addressed it within days, weeks, even you know months, right after 9-11, actually took us two years of lobbying our Virginia legislature to get a secure driver's license. My guest today is Erin Anderson. She is active in the border issues facing our country. She literally lives on the border uh, in Arizona, uh, the Mexican border. Um, Her book is The Open Borders Lobby, and while it was written a few years ago, the issues that it deals with, unhappily, haven't changed, and many of the same players that she was talking about then that are trying to keep our borders open, are still trying to keep our borders open. And I started, and as a consequence of that, I and a colleague of mine, we started to do some research on these groups, and we found out that there was a whole host of these uh, organizations, um, we generically call them the Open Borders Lobby, they're MALDEF, LULAC, LARAZA, the Immigration Defense Fund, the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, the Migration Policy Institute, the National Immigration Law Center, the Open Society Institute, Southern Poverty Law Center. Some of these names, uh, I'm sure, are familiar to the listening audience, but these groups started out very small, but the main funder behind all of these groups were the Ford Foundation, and then it was the MacArthur Foundation, and now it's George Zoros. So it's absolutely frightening to find out that we, Jane and Joe citizens, trying to, uh, you know, just defend, you know, what's right for us in America, we're going up in a huge lobby that to this day has got the ear of our elected officials on Capitol Hill 
and, and, and the power and the money at the present because all of these groups have offices here in the Washington D.C. area on you know on prestigious uh, addresses. These are this is a high rent district in the Washington D.C. area. And you know, for and, for Republicans that think that open borders is no problem. Yeah. They really need to look themselves in the mirror and say, why am I al- al- allied with Soros, Ford Foundation, and the folk, uh, well, they may not know the MacArthur Foundation as much, although if they ever listen to National Public Radio, uh, they can't yeah. miss the fact that they fund them as well. And, and it's sort of like the unholy trinity financing things on the left. And yet we have Republicans that seem to be clueless that they're helping the agenda of people like that. Yes. Absolutely. A good example is um, is an attorney named um, Stewart. Um, this is a lady who uh, I, I was affiliated with the National Lawyers Guild. And by the way, the National Lawyers Guild originally started out oh in the uh, they started out in the in the 1930s. They were originally founded as being a Soviet front group. Mm-hmm. That's how they started out. A cat's but, paw uh, of the uh, American Communist Party uh, USA. Communist Party USA, I guess, is their official name to this day. Uh, by the way, the same folks that endorsed uh, President Obama for re-election. So right. they don't run their own candidate. They had one running in the Democrat Party. <laughs> right, exactly. But anyway, just to finish the story on this Lynn Stewart... Uh, again, National Lawyers uh, Guild attorney. She was the attorney for Omar Abdel Rahman, um, who plotted to kill and kidnap people overseas. The ways of uh, winning his release, he was involved in um, you know the con- the 19- he was um, involved in 1990. Uh, he was convicted in 95 on charges to blow up the you know New York landmarks. But she was his attorney. So there, um, she's just one example. Isla, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, uh, a lady who worked for them um, named Jean Butterworth, before she came to work uh, or head up the um, Isla, American Immigration Lawyers Association, she was the executive director of the Palestinian Solidarity Committee, which was the political arm of the Popular Front for the liberation of Palestine. Anyway, where I'm going wow. with all this, these are major data points that show you there is a direct linkage between illegal immigration, these open borders lobbies, and now the terrorist groups that are now collecting um, uh, are, are well uh, established throughout Latin America, Central America, and now Mexico. And this we know um, from where I come from on the border, the, uh, the surge of illegal aliens coming across the border is massive, but we've been enduring this not for 10 years, but much longer. And we can, we, uh, the ranchers, the farmers, the residents along the southern border can verify to you, you know, irrefutably, they are co- picking up Korans and prayer rugs and all kinds of evidence that Muslims are coming across that border and have been coming across that border since before 9-11. Pretty amazing stuff. We're going to take a break now. We're talking with Erin Anderson. She's the author of The Open Borders Lobby, and as you've just heard, is sitting on the open border. The Bill of Rights protects every American's God-given right to keep and bear arms. Now that right is being seriously undermined as legally registered rifles are being confiscated in some parts of our country. If we're not careful, we may find ourselves with no right to own guns. And that's where Gun Owners of America comes in. Gun Owners of America is in Washington every day fighting for you to keep that right. Congressman Ron Paul has called GOA the only no-compromise gun lobby in Washington. You need to be part of this great grassroots group of activists who are keeping the heat on their members of Congress. Find out right now how you can join. Call 888-886-GUNS and get started receiving their fact-filled newsletters and action alerts. Call 888-886-GUNS or go to their webpage at gunowners.org and help make your voice heard in Washington. Make that call right now and call Gun Owners of America at 888-886-GUNS. Remember, it's not just about gun control, it's about control. This is Live Fire, and here once again is your host, Executive Director of Gun Owners of America, Larry Pratt. My guest today is Erin Anderson. 
She is active in the border issues facing our country. She literally lives on the border uh, in Arizona, uh, the Mexican border. Her book is The Open Borders Lobby, and while it was written a few years ago, the issues that it deals with, unhappily, haven't changed, and many of the same players that she was talking about then that are trying to keep our borders open are still trying to keep our borders open, and they've been rather successful. We've, it's an amazing thing that both parties in our country have an, uh, a tenacious desire to keep these borders open. And the idea that there might even be a security issue involved uh, just doesn't seem to phase them. And yet, Aaron, they can't be ignorant of what you've probably found yourself on your own property, a prayer rug, a Koran, uh, some sort of indication that it's not just Manuel coming across the border, but quite a few Muhammads. Oh, absolutely. And the truth be known, um, I know since at least the uh, Bush administration, there were uh, various meetings by our, um, our our elected officials, Senators Kyle, um, McCain. Um, they all got the uh, behind-closed-door briefings identifying the th- connection and the threat coming across from the southern border. And what's a very alarming today, uh, right now we're hearing about, well, um, the, the dreamers, okay? Consistently, all of this time, the same entities are promoting the open borders. Not only the open borders lobby that I mentioned, La Raza, Maldef, Rulat, and, and so forth, but the issue can basically be uh, well separated out by, think of the entities that are supporting this. It's big business, big labor, big agriculture, even, uh, sadly, uh, large Christian groups, okay, all lined up, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, all lined up against two other entities, the U.S. Constitution and Jane and Joe Citizens. Now, the, yep. the fact that unions would be involved in this, uh, I'm presuming that with a shrinking percentage of the labor force that's unionized, uh, big labor looks at this as their next best shot at uh, getting some more folks forced into their ranks. Is that the way you see it? Yes, absolutely. Um, when you look at the unions, all right, and early on, it was interesting, um, uh, uh, the, the, mo- the Jane and Joe citizens, blue-collar uh, construction workers, those guys, they were very resistant to illegal aliens coming into their um, area. Um, for, a, for a while, remember, painters and construction workers would report on when an illegal alien was hired into their into their team because they thought legitimately as as true competition and taking away their their jobs. I know of a marine early on when we first went into Afghanistan, a marine from Colorado, used to be a construction worker. He comes back from com, you know combat in the war zone and he finds that his job in Colorado is now given over to um, uh, an illegal alien. It's how um, SEIU, the Service um, Service Employees International Union, what are they? Predominantly Hispanics who took over the service industries. But I know back home, you know, in home in Arizona, we have Mexican Americans. Those were our jobs. Okay, um, the jobs that went to um, uh, the fast food, uh, the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, the, the hamburger flip joints, all of these jobs were never meant to be jobs where you could support yourself and a family. These were jobs that went to entry-level people like, you know, my community, uh, the youngsters, the kids, I, uh, high school kids. I remember youngsters telling me that when they were used to working in a restaurant, um, how it started, they say, how they started to lose their jobs is the the owner first started to hire uh, illegal aliens to work back in the kitchens and do the dishwashing. And then because there was a language problem between those who only spoke Spanish in the kitchen versus the American kids who who were waiting tables in front, well, the American kids lost the job and they went to illegal aliens. And this became prevalent throughout the western states, especially the southwest, you know, in Arizona and Utah. These are what the youngsters were telling me. 
And interestingly, the one state that did the uh, best in fighting this was Arizona. Arizona tends to be the tip of the spear. Um, it's the one state that methodically, uh, with each um, election year, where they could introduce um, a legislation at, at the initiative process, they gradually tightened up their immigration laws until they succeeded in passing E-Verify statewide. And that's what drove Eric Holder nuts, was that Arizona was in the forefront of uh, immigration uh, matters. Yes. Well, E-Verify actually went through and is still there. What really tripped the trigger with Eric Holder and the rest of the nation was SB 1070. And there's an interesting story about that. SB 1070 gave law enforcement more powers to, you know, if they stopped you uh, for committing um, a, a speed or whatever, they could kind of ask you for identification. It has always been my thought that actually part of behind, behind SB 1070 was Phoenix, Arizona, was the number two kidnapped capital of the world <laughs> because of the uh, Mexico City being the first one, Phoenix being second, because of the depth and breadth of cartel infiltration. As a consequence of SB 1070 being, uh, okay, great. Anyway, what, it's an interesting, uh, backstory on SB 1070. As a consequence of SB 1070 being, being considered for passage, the Sinaloa cartel, which was well established in Phoenix, pulled up roots and started to move out of the state and moved into Oklahoma. Do you? No joke. Um, Let, well, let's pick up on that transnational point when we get back from the break. That's something that uh, I wasn't very familiar with, and I want those listening to hear about that as well, talking with Aaron Anderson. Now, more news about the threats to your liberties and your right to keep and bear arms. This is Live Fire. And here once again is your host, Executive Director of Gun Owners of America, Larry Pratt. My guest is Aaron Anderson, lives right on the Arizona-Mexico border, author of a book several years ago, The Open Borders Lobby. And we were just starting to get into the fact that the Mexican cartels have morphed into the a transnational uh, crime syndicate. Uh, Aaron, let's get into some detail on that because I think we need to know about that. that we... It can't assume that the cartel is just something that's afflicting people in Arizona. No, absolutely not. It is now an, a, a, a definitely a national issue, and more importantly, it's a national security issue. Um, you can now rightly say most every town in America now qualifies as a border town or a border community. Um, uh, with regards to uh, the cartel... Yeah, they definitely, the cartels, the Sinaloa, the Gulf, the Zetas, the Juarez, all of them started out as just ordinary drug cartels, okay? And then um, the illegal immigration issue started. So the Jane and Joe citizens, with the help of the infrastructure from their own government, make accommodating their flow north to the United States, they encourage their citizens to go north and get established in the United States. When the cartels... Now, when, they, they, when you say they encourage... Um, it's my understanding that there are some rather stunningly open uh, ways they do that with advertisements uh, on in the media, uh, signs, all, all kinds of, when you get to America, this is the way you hook up for welfare and uh, other benefits. How do you get th across the border? The, go the Mexican government's been very helpful to its folks. Exceedingly, exceedingly. And this, again, is also very alarming. Um, it, it, but such, it was then such a benefit to Mexico and, in, and now also to the cartels. But uh, speaking of the government, the gov Mexican government set up a formal uh, government ministry to serve, to do nothing but service and address the issues and concerns of their citizens legal and illegally present in the United States. And then we're crazy enough, I guess, in most, if not all of our states, to accept a Mexican ID card as the way they can get a driver's license. And once they've got that driver's license, uh, no further questions are going to be asked. Exactly, because that was, um, that was, that's been a major fight 
um, here in the United States where at the state level, individual states have had to fight individually at their state and local level to tighten up on their individual driver's license laws like we did um, in, in the state of Virginia, which was a direct consequence result of the events of, of 9-11. But the, 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 the document that helped uh, provide Mexicans with uh, presence here in the United States was what we refer to as the matricular consular card, which was issued by the Mexican consulate here in the United States, which and, and the Mexican government has established anywhere between 60, 66 maybe, Mexican consulates throughout the U.S. to provide for their citizens in the U.S. And um, one of the major benefits, of course, to Mexico was that um, their citizens here in the U.S. would send their monies back to Mexico, which variously would could be anywhere from the first, second, third major source of income to Mexico, uh, depending on where tourism was or where the price of oil was versus these remittances. Now, going back to that, the most alarming thing about Mexican government and this ministry is not only did they con- set up this ministry to, to accommodate their citizens here, both legally or illegally, but they wanted their citizens to stay in the U.S. They encouraged them to stay here, get established, get jobs, go ahead, and, and, and mind you, they wanted them to maintain their citizenship with Mexico, and they wanted them to, to vote absentee in Mexican elections. They wanted to keep their connection with Mexico. These, those here are very loyal to their home country, Mexico, and, and Mexico, you know, encourages it. But you, also, now, you mentioned uh, their their voting back home. Uh, yeah. What I have learned yeah. over, the, over the time is that the Mexican election laws should be adopted here in the United States. They have well, okay. much greater security with uh, ballots, with uh, ID. Uh, it's not nearly the casual mess that we have in this country. Oh, no, no, they have much more stringent and appropriate uh, voter ID laws. And as a matter of fact, their, um, their, their immigration and border security laws are considerably uh, uh, more um, stringent than ours. So but, it's kind of a one-way open door. Okay to go north, yes. don't even think about coming south. Oh, yeah, but, uh, but uh, just to finish what I was starting to say with regards to what Mexico encourages their citizens to do here, they encourage them, one, to maintain and their loyalty and patriotism to Mexico, but they encourage their citizens to stay in the U.S. and get U.S. citizenship with the express purpose that once you get U.S. citizenship, you will vote in U.S. elections, but when you vote in U.S. elections, you will vote with Mexico in your heart. Yes, you won't be voting for any of those stinking conservatives. No, not at all. And now, and now the danger here is uh, what we're seeing now currently on Capitol Hill. I was very alarmed during the hearing last week for the dreamers. Okay, everybody seems to have a soft spot for these poor children who were brought here, dragging and screaming against their will here to the United States. What's alarming is... The, anybody technically can qualify for a dreamer. Um, we're hearing from our uh, in, uh, interior enforcement guys, our ICE agents, Border Patrol. Um, we're hearing it to this day. We have Border Patrol agents right now on the border saying we're getting people coming across the border now saying I'm a dreamer. And they don't have to provide any kind of documentation, ID, school transcripts, dates, you know, age, anything. They just say, I'm a dreamer. And in that category, you are now getting cartel members who can now stand up and say, I am cartel. You are now getting people coming across the border who aren't really Mexican or Guatemalan or Hispanic. We don't know who they really are because um, there are these um, facilities south of the border that where someone who is of more of an Arabic or Muslim extraction, they can sort of hang out for a while on some hacienda here or there for a few months, learn the Spanish language, learn the Mexican culture or the Nicaraguan culture and those countries' um, national anthems and figure out which the soccer teams are. Anyway, 
because there is a questionnaire that there were times when our Border Patrol agents would ask these people coming across the border to try and identify their nationality. And, it, and, and you know, it wasn't too hard for some of these people who were trying to pass themselves off as a Mexican or Nicaraguan or Guatemalan. They succeeded in passing themselves off as another nationality just to get established here. And now those same people are now coming across still and are able to claim, I'm a dreamer. And that's all they need to say is, I'm a dreamer, daddy yes. brought me here, and I don't have any proof of it? Exactly, yeah. As a matter of fact, agents have said we're picking up, you know, people with tattoos. And the tattoos, you, as you know, uh, are, are indicators of being MS-13, the Mata Salvatrucha, one of the most notorious gangs coming out of El Salvador. But also, we, uh, um, to give you a, uh, where these cartels, i.e. transnational criminal organizations, are such a huge national security threat to us uh, providing conduits for the, the, um, for the terrorists, is we are now um, getting people coming across with tattoos, but they're in Arabic. Oh, my. Uh, yeah, we, and uh, I, I remember talking to a, uh, a military person uh, describing this, and he looked at me and he says, how is it that little uh, young Mexican males um, who, are, who are Catholics could somehow be uh, in, persuaded into becoming Muslims? And I go, well, first of all, they are members of MS-13. And in order to become a member of MS-13, the first thing this young male does is take an oath to the devil oh. so he doesn't qualify as being a good catholic altar boy anymore so it's not a hard it's not much of a stretch to go from taking an oath to the devil to converting to islam that is extraordinary that uh, there's something that openly evil uh, we got to talk about that a little bit more when we get back from this last break talking with Aaron Anderson, author of The Open Borders Lobby. This is Live Fire, and here once again is your host, Executive Director of Gun Owners of America, Larry Pratt. Well, folks, if you didn't pick up on what we heard going into the break, wanted to make sure it's repeated that when recruits into the Salvatrucha, the MS-13, are being inducted, they take an oath to the devil. I haven't heard of anything happening like that since the country of Haiti was organized uh, after they freed themselves from French colonial rule and dedicated their country for the next 200 years to Satan. And uh, those kind of things are not empty words. Uh, there is going to be an accounting for those folks, but I think it also means they're willing to do any evil thing one can imagine. Absolutely, and um, this should be a major concern for Americans here within the United States, especially in light of them considering, even considering the Dreamers Act, because how, um, very quickly, I'll summarize, the entire illegal drug trade in the United States owned, operated, and conducted by a foreign entity. Mexican drug cartels, i.e. transnational criminal organizations, those people who are distributing and enforcing this trade are, te are by and large, um, uh, the, the gangs, the Mata Salvatrucha, the, uh, the 18th Street Gang, Mexican Mafia, you know, you know, pick a gang, but, and, and they tend to be, you know, young male teenagers, okay? And um, this is, and they qualify as being dreamers. Now, um, once the, um, the drug cartels recognize the benefit uh, to them of controlling the illegal immigration uh, flow into the United States, they took it over. And uh, when debriefing uh, certain cartel guys, they'll tell you flat out, we control the U.S. border with Mexico. We guarantee 90% of our product will get across. And that can easily translate to saying they control 90% of our border. And um, Now, their product doesn't just include drugs. I presume it's also the sex trade and who knows what else. Precisely. So the code word on the American side, because um, some of our elected officials 
um, at the national, the state level, don't like to talk about illegal immigration, but they will mention human trafficking. Well, human trafficking is not something that just sprung up in the United States. It's not something we do. Human trafficking is code for illegal immigration, or it's code for one of the menu of products the Mexican transnational criminal organizations provide. Drugs were just the lead, the lead product. Now it's uh, illegal immigration, it's human trafficking, it's a murder for hire, it's, um, it's money laundering, it's um, kidnapping, extortion. I mean, uh, they're even getting into um, the matter of oil. They've, they've been disruptive to Mexico's oil uh, pipelines, um, trying to hijack into that trade, um, and, and even into pirated DVDs and CDs. So when Americans on this side say, oh, we can um, neutralize and, and, uh, and weaken the cartels by just legalizing or decriminalizing drugs, they're dreaming. The cartels are awash in billions of dollars of money. That's not going away. That's not evaporating at all. Now, and all of this is happening, and it's happening on your ranch and that of your neighbors. It's just mind-numbing that you're being yeah. subjected to this level and extent of criminal activity. Precisely. And this is, this is what is most alarming, and no one is hearing about it because, one, the victims are not talking, and uh, we no longer have the freedom of press now to talk about it. But everything you're hearing on the Mexican side of the border regarding people being killed, threatened, uh, kidnapped, uh, or what, uh, you know, all of that, um, or being forced off their ranch or their land. If you don't take the bribe, you'll take um, the bullet, that sort of thing. Um, that's happening on the American side because uh, corruption is the lifeblood uh, of, of the cartels in Mexico. So corrupting a local law enforcement, a border patrol agent, a mayor, a town council, a uh, county board of supervisors, a judge, an elected official, whether he's a congressman or senator, that is not outside the realm of what is now happening on the American side. But for those who live, live on the border, whether it's Arizona, New Mexico, or Texas, they are now living in constant terror. Um, in a community that I am uh, closely acquainted with, um, the traffickers now coming across are now uh, extremely well organized. Uh, you'd say they'd have uh, the equivalent of military training, um, the combat boots, the fatigues, the black masks, carrying weapons, and they are hauling a cargo across. And um, they, uh, the ranchers or the farmers in these areas where they are coming through, these ranchers or farmers are now having to wear bulletproof vests when they're out. Um, one young family, uh, the wife can no longer be left alone back at the ranch house. Um, she now has to go everywhere with her husband as he works the lawn, as he works the fence, as he works his, his stocking ponds, um, attends to his cattle, his animals, whatever. The wife has to be with him 24-7. She can never be left alone. We have an incident where one family, um, the, uh, uh, they, they had to uh, go to a local locksmith and get the box so that when their house is swarmed, hit by people coming through, um, they, uh, they know they can uh, take the toddlers and put them into one closet and lock them in there so they'll be secure. Mm. And the family go to the door of the windows carrying their weapons until those illegals and, and the, the, the couriers pass on. Then now, if they were to have to shoot out of the window, I presume they would have to shoot between the bars on the windows? Yeah, all of them have, this, of course, all of them have security devices you wouldn't believe, bars on the windows, all of those things that are necessary. But, <laughs> um, and then there's another closet where, um, if the house is swarmed, um, they will, uh, there's one closet where the, the wife will grab the toddlers, retreat to that closet, and there are weapons and um, bullets and locks from the inside so that uh, as she stays there calling for help. Because uh, in these isolated areas, the 911 is not law enforcement, it's not Border Patrol, it's not the sheriff, it's the next rancher down the road. Your 911 is your neighbor. And you just pray like the Dickens 
that um, at your hold up in that closet with your weapon, the cartel guys will not get to you before those your neighboring rancher will be there to help. It's okay. um, sort of a, a throwback to the 19th century before we had sheriffs and police. Uh, people had to have a hue and cry uh, and depend on the neighbors, just like you're describing. Yes. Well, unlike in 1900 or, or, or uh, back in the old days, we never really had to worry about law enforcement or border patrol or um, we never had to worry about them being corrupt. There is now a genuine hesitation and concern um, because the Border Patrol has successfully been corrupted by the cartel. Oh, there's so much money. Yeah, exactly. The money, well, the money and the alternative uh, in defense of some young agents who are, are ill-equipped to handle this, um, the threat that will come to them. Um, either you take the bribe or somebody in the family gets hurt. The expression in Spanish is plomo o plata, uh, lead okay. or silver, uh, or okay. money, because they use the word silver for money. So lead right. or money, and that's your choice, pal. Which is it? Oof. Yeah, and um, and the other dilemma for some uh, Border Patrol agents who are honest and ethical, they're not sure about their supervisor. You know, we, we have incidences where a supervisor who is in the pay of the cartel will assign his agents to one canyon so that the drugs can go through another canyon. Um, the, um, the equipment and the, car, uh, the communications equipment that the cartel men have, um, one rancher happened to uh, a scare one of these cartel guys I uh, caught him at an awkward moment. He dumped everything and he ran away. Well, listen, we've run out of time. Aaron Anderson, take care, I guess, is uh, not just a meaningless expression. Uh, we really wish you the best. And let's hope that we get some change. Our rights to keep and bear arms has never been under as much attack. And gun owners of America are fighting daily in Washington to protect that right. GOA is the only no-compromise gun lobby in Washington. And remember, it's not just about gun control. It's about control.